The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome the panelists. Andreas Antonopoulos, Bitcoin hey, everyone. commentator. Chris J. from Feathercoin. Hello. Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Excellent to be here. And Megan Lords from Bitcoin, not bombs. Hey, how's it going? Our top story tonight is the new Bitcoin Group. Dot com. Did you know at the bitcoingroup.com you can donate bitcoins by pushing the donate bitcoins button? You can even scan this this QR code. Also, the Bitcoin Group is now available on audio podcast at soundcloud.com slash madbitcoins1. Madbitcoins1, your radio station that now has the Bitcoin Group. Soon we will be added to iTunes. Old episodes now available. Also, Mad Bitcoins was nominated for a Shorty Award. But our first story tonight is Zhao Tong. You just got Mount Gox. Indeed. See, these exchanges ain't all what Bitcoin are made of. It's a quarter what they make of. So you hate it, stop the hate it. So come on in, bring your friends up inside. Let me tell you about Bitcoins and how you must get it right. Get it right. trade with Mount Gizzle, always change your eye drizzles. We stopped trading for shizzle years ago when we fizzle. Come on. Waiting on when drizzles, oh nizzle. I'm out this bizzle. Mount Gox. Mount Gox. Gox, 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 and more Gox. Mount Gox claimed that their security concerns caused them to move and miss their Thursday deadline and not the presence of their shirt sleeve CEO in the snow. After their announcement, the Mt. Gox price fell to $100, the lowest it's been since July. The Bitstamp price followed to $564. When will this Mt. Gox nonsense end? Will it fall to zero? What's really going on? I ask you, Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, apparently not satisfied with my uh, proclamation of the clownish incompetence of management, now I'm getting uh, accused on Reddit of somehow being a co-conspirator with Gox because I haven't called them outright thieves and fraudsters. I'm going too lenient because clownish incompetence really doesn't even begin to explain things, at least for many people. I thought it was a sufficient and full explanation for everything that's happened, but really, Mark, are you trying to challenge that concept? Because you move in the middle of a development emergency, yeah, that's a great way to get the development team to work harder. Um, hey guys, pack your stuff, we're moving. We're moving to a land free of protesters who won't stop me on my morning frappe latte run and ask me annoying and difficult questions like, where the hell's my money, you short-sleeved idiot? Well, here we go again. Uh, I, don't, I could not imagine that Mark Carpellis could increase the level of incompetence, but apparently he has. And at this point, even I'm thinking, really, is there more to this story? I thought incompetence explained it, but, but you're really pushing the narrative, Mark. You're really making it difficult for anyone to still believe that you're not a fraudster. It's getting very, very hard. Chris J. Oh, gosh. I, don't, I hate to say I told you so, but haven't I been predicting this the last two weeks? And my prediction for next week is that we will be talking about this again, and hopefully this time we'll just be talking about Mark Carpellis, the individual. And... Ah, the guy needs to come clean. All right, if you're listening to this, Mark, and you know what, you know I love you. you. We had a moment on IRC. Do you remember a couple of months ago? I put in a support ticket, and I reached out to you, and you actually sorted it out for me. I know you're there. I know you can hear me when I PM you on IRC. I think the guy needs to come clean. He needs to just fess up. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's lost all the coins and it's some big fuck up, but whatever it is, he just needs to come clean because the real theft right now is the theft of everybody's time and attention. Instead of talking about the heroes of Bitcoin, we're talking about, as Andreas puts it, a clown. And it's distracting us from where Bitcoin can really go. We've had some great news this week. Um, 
Bitcoin's got some huge potential. You know, we've got an ATM in Boston, um, and PayPal are now making moves to get into the space. This isn't about frictionless shopping. This is about getting money into third world countries. And all he's doing is derailing the entire conversation. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot to say. I was hoping I did. I went onto the IRC channel before I came on here. Um, looking for some information. No, there's no information. Um, just one last support staff, Neo Future calls himself on the on the IRC, and he's the last guy standing. Sarah and Delirium, um, apparently, the, the other support staff, uh, were getting married. I don't know who gets married in February. <laughs> not, not the best month. Um, but they told everyone the other day uh, that they were getting married and they wouldn't be on the MT Gox uh, IRC support channel anymore. And so now it's just one guy. They all claimed when asked and put under quite a lot of pressure from, from customers, like, are you actually proper contractors? Are they paying you? Or are you just customers who are getting perks for, for modding on the IRC? They claimed that they were proper contractors, but Delirium said that although he is a contractor, he does trade on MT Gox, but he made clear that he didn't have access to any inside information, that he, he would literally, he just got given stuff to say and then he would just say it, but he didn't have any information. I find it hard to believe that nobody has any inside information in the story. After all, we did see the price crash a good four to five hours before the announcement the other day. I was on IRC when that happened and I went on there when the crash happened. Do you know, do you know what uh, I'm talking about? The, the price actually crashed ahead of the announcement, that there was no announcement, that effectively this was an update about an update. And so that would hint towards, um, so, so the way exchanges work is they, they actually set up around liquidity pools. Exchanges are not startups that, you know, have great hopes and ambitions about, you know, one day providing liquidity into a fresh young market and market making for it. Um, it's actually uh, built around rich people who wish to gain exposure to an emerging asset class who also want some inside information on, on who's trading. When you run an exchange, you know what's in everyone's account. You see all inbound transactions. You have background info. You can front run their trades. That means that if you see somebody else put in a trade, you can um, put in what's called an order type, which means that you can match their order, but yours will get filled before theirs does. And so you actually get like a top layer view. That's how exchanges work. And it's not a secret. Like this is, I'm not breaking any news here. This is how exchanges work. And so what happened was people pulled them up on this, pulled the staff up on this and said, well, that, that can't be a coincidence. And so the support staff claimed, um, I don't have the log file on me, but uh, from my recollection was that somebody must have second guessed the URL for the announcement and that what, what someone must have done is they must have worked out what the URL was when the lawyers had to go and approve it. So quite how this approval process works, I haven't seen any evidence at all that anyone works for MT Gox other than Mark Carpellis. Do you? Has anyone ever seen anyone or heard from anyone other than Mark ever? I, I, I would not be surprised if it's just him on a laptop in a virtual office in Japan. And I think that he has screwed up. He knows he's I guess screwed up. The protester up. guy saw the uh, like the secretary person. Oh, okay. On the floor, right? Oh like, yeah, sure. But was it. she not the secretary of the building? Is she not? No. Who knows? Yeah, I haven't seen any evidence that anybody other than Mark works there. And his his um, username on the IRC is on twenty four seven. So he's obviously just got a machine that's just left on the whole time. And, and of course now what's happening is everyone's trying to work out the intentions. Now that we've seen what hap what's happened, everyone's trying to work out, well, did he mean it? Is, was this meant to happen? Was this deliberate? I don't think it was. I don't think there's been any malice here, but I do think he's made a screw up and he's too embarrassed and he doesn't want to face the inevitable and somebody needs to go in there and, and talk him down and, and say, look, you have to have a very, I know it's going to be awkward, but we have to have a frank, candid conversation about this. So those are my thoughts. Christoph Atlas. All right, here's what I think happened. Um, there were some angry depositors that showed up, and they were actually ninjas. They uh, snuck into the building, and they posed as pizza delivery guys. They said, hey, Mark, we got to get some pizzas. Who ordered a pizza? And Mark was like, I did. And, uh, and then they attacked. So all of the employees fled to the roof, and they were evacuated by a helicopter while Mark fended them off with his samurai sword, 
and that's why they had to make the emergency move. Uh, I think that's what happened, and um, I think we'll all come to see that uh, Mark is a great hero in this story when uh, everything is revealed. I agree, and I think that was much better writing than the press release. <laughs> Megan Lords. <laughs> That was great. Um, the more information that comes out about this, the uh, harder it is to believe the kind of incompetency that's going on and just kind of like, uh, this is really terrible. And probably the worst part about it is that it makes Bitcoin look bad to people who don't know anything about Bitcoin. It's making our jobs harder to go out and get business owners into Bitcoin and get, you know, just individuals and, you know, people we know into Bitcoin because they're seeing all this volatility that's caused by Gox. They're seeing you know all of this controversy and I uh, you know it, it looks really bad and like Chris J said he just needs to come out with the truth just however bad it is whatever happened uh, he just needs to come out and uh, be straightforward with people I hope it ends soon I really do uh, you know I don't think it's going to affect obviously Bitcoin in the long run but it does make our job a lot harder well the simplest explanation is usually the right one Right, So if there was a transaction malleability issue within Gox and they automated withdrawals, they obviously got taken for a large number of Bitcoin in automated withdrawals. How much Bitcoin if they got taken? We don't really know, but I do agree with Chris J. Mark, if you've made a mistake, if you've had some kind of coding error that's led to a massive loss of wealth for your company, you may as well come out with it. The more you cover it up, the worse it's going to get. Look at the Chris Christie situation. He's only making it worse. You're stuck in tar. You have to stop struggling and call for help. Exit question. When will this Gox nonsense end? Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, when Mark Karpelis resigns as CEO and uh, appoints a professional CEO to replace him, and until then nothing will change. The uh, nature of the latest crazy scare and debacle will change, but the problem at the root of this will not. Chris, Jay. I think um, I'd go a little bit further than I'd say we need to get an independent auditor involved. I mean, this is what happens. I've been involved <clears throat> from the outside. I've been involved in a number of liquidations of companies that I owed money to. And I've seen a lot of frauds in my time, and I know how to recognize it. I've got a very keen eye for it. And what happens is the, the, the we, we, because the, we're no longer customers now, we're victims. And the perpetrator will go into denial. They'll even deny the truth to themselves. And what they'll do is they'll kick the can down the road, and they'll tell themselves stories about how it's going to be OK. It's OK if we just keep the exchange trading. We let people make deposits. I'll make it back in fees. You know, he, he's probably telling himself this story, but the only remedy, really, to get closure for the creditors, to get closure for, for, for the customers, so they can just get on with their lives, so they can make plans about their financial histories, which a lot of people are struggling with at the moment, um, is to have an independent auditor who's disinterested in the emotions of the case, who can go through the books. And, and what I actually feel sorry for Roger Ver as well, because, you know, he went in there and he looked at their books, apparently, uh, over the summer, was it, um, and, and actually did that. Uh, went on video and it's like dude that guy's got some amazing credibility it, that's his reputation too so I think they need somebody that's properly independent to go in there and audit the books Christoph Atlas well I think even after the company kind of goes through the goes through the bottom of the, the red line I think that it will continue to get coverage in the news for a while because there are certain media outlets just that just love piling on top of the, uh, you know, Bitcoin as a bubble, they don't know what they're doing kind of stuff. And it's actually, um, it's fascinating to see some of the news coverage because um, it's embarrassing how poorly researched it is. Like a major media outlet saying, oh, the Bitcoin price has gone through, you know, less than $100. And it's like, no, a lottery ticket for a Bitcoin has gone through less than $100, but not, not Bitcoins. And it's just amazing. It makes you think, like, what else are they misreporting about, you know, that they can't bother to, you know, put five minutes of research or ask someone that's knowledgeable about Bitcoin before they put an article out, and they're just like, erp, erp, I can read a graph, and, well, oh, but $100, okay, put it in. Um, 
yeah, it's you know it's it's disconcerting to see that kind of stuff, and I think we'll continue to hear about Mt. Gox for a while, and we'll have to you know defend ourselves um, against the the record of Mt. Gox. The reporting has been unfortunate, but remember, it was the New York Post. The New York Post. Megan Lords. I think Christophe made a really good point about uh, the media frenzy around it. I think that part is going to last longer than um, the whole situation with Gox. And, uh, yeah, I hope it's resolved as soon as possible, though. Um, you know, there are people uh, that are really hurting here, and, uh, you know, th this needs to be resolved as quickly as possible. And whatever it takes to do that, you know, hopefully, uh, and, you know, maybe we're looking at a matter of weeks instead of months here. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, I'd like it to be done by next week because I'm tired of talking about it. Issue 2, Week of Bitcoin ATMs. Bitcoin ATMs were opening everywhere this week, with ATMs popping up in Boston, Austin, and even New Mexico, with plans for expansion into Singapore and London. How big of a development is this for Bitcoin? Do we need two-way ATMs where you can get fiat out, or just one-way Bitcoin machines? Will this encourage Bitcoin spending or Bitcoin hoarding? I ask you, Chris J. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. So these ATMs, we actually did um, a live stream on Feathercoin of the CoinFest in Vancouver, and Dogecoin had released what looked like uh, a flight case with a mobile phone stuck on it with some gaffer tape. No, I might be being a bit harsh with the gaffer tape, but it was it was definitely a flight case. And um, you know what? I love this. Joking aside, I I looked into making an ATM back in the autumn uh, with a friend of mine who makes like hardware and stuff. It's surprisingly difficult, but what it looks like is somebody very clever has come along and worked out a way of, of doing it. Essentially, the way they work is that they print out a private key. Is that your understanding? That's what I saw on the live stream. It depends which machine you're using, but yeah, a lot of them will just give you the wallet. But yeah, no, I think they're brilliant, and I think what they actually do is give people extra liquidity um, in, into and out of the market. We talked a lot about doing putting them into shops so that people could so then the shop would actually get the cash from the ATM that they would then be able to put into the till. So you'd have this kind of rotation of money. So you'd have people wanting to spend the coins in the shop and then people wanting to deposit the coins. And then rather than the uh, merchant having to behave like a speculator, um, they could just uh, get the liquidity directly from the ATM. So I, th yeah, I think these are fantastic. I think that's an interesting idea and a, a way of a business to be self-sufficient acting as its own bank and encouraging the trading of a digital currency while you know not interrupting their normal business. You can just use the ATM, change your money in and out, pay either way at the register. I think that's an interesting future right there. Christoph, Atlas. Well, I think the, the deployment of ATMs is very exciting. Um, I know both uh, Chris Yim and Kyle Powers who co-founded the Liberty Tellers in Boston. Uh, they're both fellow Bitcoin Philadelphia meetup members. And I'm looking forward to seeing one deployed in Philadelphia as well, as long as as soon as they are able to resolve the, the lingering regulatory issues. Um, I'm mostly interested in seeing machines that can be used to purchase Bitcoin. I think that the regulations for machines that you know dispense cash are going to be stiffer. Um, and what we really need right now is to onboard people into the cryptocurrency economy. Um, keep in mind that once you get Bitcoin, you can exchange it for a variety of cryptocurrencies. So these ATMs are going to be a perfect on-ramp for uh, all of the cryptocurrencies that there are out there. Um, and I just want to remind people that Bitcoin ATMs are not a reliable way of obtaining Bitcoins anonymously. It's very easy for someone to set up a hidden camera and record use of an ATM without your knowledge or your consent. So don't expect that necessarily your ATM transaction is going to be anonymous, so to speak. Megan Lords. I think this is a great development. I can't wait to use one. Um, I would like to see um, the two-way ATMs. I think those would be better for people who are kind of uncomfortable with the idea of Bitcoin. And just the, the idea of a Bitcoin ATM makes it more appealing to a more mainstream uh, audience. Um, and I don't, I don't think people will care too much about the anonymity 
I know a lot of Bitcoiners do. It's something that I'm concerned with, but I don't think your average person cares that much about it. I, I think it's going to be a more accessible way for them to get Bitcoin, uh, you know, without having to meet up in person or know someone or, you know, go through any other method. So I, I think this is great. And yeah, I'd like to see more uh, widespread. I am concerned about how they're going to try to regulate it, though. Uh, this That will be kind of interesting if they're going to try to expand the regulations even to say that an ATM can be a money transmitter service or something. Uh, so I'm curious to see the development of that, but I think otherwise this is really good news for Bitcoin. Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, two-way ATMs are complex. I like the uh, simpler version of uh, the Bitcoin uh, vending machine, and I think uh, legally that also offers a much easier path to acceptance. I think one of the things we forget to consider is that many people would find local bitcoins or an exchange a very dicey proposition and especially uh, local bitcoins in terms of physical safety um, I used to run uh, small value amounts on uh, local bitcoins uh, to help newbies you know under fifty dollars on average uh, to help newbies get bitcoin and I had structured my ads to be appealing to people who had safety concerns and what I found was a lot of younger people and a lot of women preferred uh, preferred my ads because um, they they were concerned about their physical safety when interacting with a complete stranger in a Craigslist type environment. I think ATMs solve that, and it's an even better uh, solution to that to onboard um, you know a different demographic for bitcoins uh, that than might use say local bitcoins. All of these on ramps are great. I'd like to see them more. I think the U.S. is lagging behind quite uh, quite a bit because of the uh, regulation, so we need to see that fixed. I agree, and I, I think the Bitcoin ATMs are a great temporary solution, and they're something that we need during the adoption that we might not need afterwards. I'd like to see the two-way ATM machines because I'd like to see someone come in with a QR code and then make the machine just rain out money. I really like the idea of that. But I do agree it's a much greater regulatory challenge to have a two-way ATM. And some of the machines don't even allow anonymity because they're worried about the money uh, transmitter laws and the limits of $10,000. So I think we're seeing a lot of people that might want to convert their cash hoard into Bitcoin, and they might want to do it with these machines. Other people might have a couple extra bucks and put it into savings on Bitcoin. You know, try out this new currency just as a, as a laugh. And we should encourage both of those things, I think. So, exit question. Which will see more broad adoption? One-way Bitcoin machines or Bitcoin vending machines? Is there really a future in Bitcoin-only machinery? Chris, J. Yeah, I think it's simpler, so I think that that's a good place to start. Christoph, Atlas. Yeah, I think for regulatory reasons, it's going to be... Um, there's going to be a lot more vending machines at first, and they're going to be these these two ATMs. Megan Lords. Yeah, I would agree, I would agree with Christoph on that. Um, and I, you know, I, I think there is a future in Bitcoin-only machinery. It's the most uh, popular cryptocurrency at the moment, um, and yeah, it's going to be dominating for a while. Andreas Antonopoulos. I, I think uh, one way is definitely the way to go, but I also think we're going to be seeing individuals with mobile applications become mobile ATM machines for Bitcoin, too. I know there was a person who used to sit in the cafe by the other Bitcoin ATM and offer fee-less transaction. He himself was a Bitcoin ATM. Moving Indeed. on, issue three. PayPal wants to be your digital wallet. PayPal, the Internet's failed first monetary system, has been trying to cuddle up next to Bitcoin, the Internet's successful monetary system. But no one cares. What can PayPal do to make a splash? Is an online wallet system enough, or will they just be hacked and made fools of? Will PayPal succeed? More importantly, will they survive? Christoph Atlas. Well, I think PayPal can be useful to Bitcoin by speeding the rate of adoption up. Um, I think this is going to be a defining moment for PayPal. Uh, they started with the goal of creating a digital currency, and inevitably they were shot down by governments like any centralized organization would. 
that's where Bitcoin is succeeding, is where these centralized organizations failed. And since then, they've cozied into becoming part of the legacy banking system. Uh, so much of their business now relies on the regulatory, uh, regulatory hurdles that were erected to shut out competitors. Uh, PayPal does not have a lot of free market competition. So now they have a choice. They're either going to stay with the leg legacy banking system and they're going to have to fight to oppress people's financial freedom or they're going to jump into what's going to be a very highly competitive, unregulatable uh, cryptocurrency market and that's going to be a significant, a significant adaptation for them if they decided to take that choice. Megan Lords. I'm glad to see that they finally uh, caught on, but uh, Bitcoin is a threat to them uh, as a payment system. So I, uh, I think it's a little bit too late. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I do think that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, long term, I, I think Bitcoin is going to outpace PayPal. And uh, like, like Christoph said, you know, they've always taken advantage of uh, the kind of climate in, in uh, suppressing competition and things like that. And this is something that they can't really compete against. So, uh, yeah, I don't see them lasting long term. Andreas Antonopoulos. Oh, seems to be frozen. Chris, Jay. Uh, I think PayPal is, is oh, no. a good of all of... Hey, okay, here People we go. Might... I'm back. Go Am I back? Sorry. Okay. I think PayPal is good news for Bitcoin because it actually helps establish Bitcoin uh, among people who have not heard of cryptocurrencies and will give them a much easier way to onboard. Uh, PayPal is probably the most desired way to uh, put money into Bitcoin, and it's very difficult to do that because of their um, practices with freezing accounts. But I think Bitcoin will actually benefit tremendously from PayPal adoption, and of all of the banking institutions out there that face competitive threats, I think PayPal is the most able to adapt and be flexible and actually beat the other banks to it and provide not only exchange services, but also secure storage services um, that, you know, as we're seeing with Mt. Gox and others getting hacked are, are going to be a problem for a while. So they bring that credibility, they bring the security expertise, they bring the easy on-ramp, and all of those things are going to drive the Bitcoin price uh, up and they're going to increase the mainstream adoption. So I, I'm really happy to see PayPal get interested in Bitcoin. Chris, Jay. Yeah, he's, uh, Andreas has uh, stolen my, my material. Damn it. Um, yeah, I, I well, let the story hang on. What what's the story? Is is it about PayPal, uh, one of the biggest company payment companies in the world, actually expressing an interest in in our wonderful project, or is it the lack of journalism on CoinDesk? What is with that headline? PayPal dislikes digital currencies? Question mark. I've never seen a question mark in a headline before. Then yawn. Oh man, this is really bad. I mean, this is really this is called. Well, this I is believe called there's attitude. a law about that. Oh, uh, really? L Lewis Law says any headline that ends in a question mark can be easily answered with the word no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm just quite shocked at this. I don't care who I annoy by saying it. I'm, I'm, this is called attitudinal journalism in, in the trade. And um, all it is is a bunch of opinions. What was really interesting, though, was the interview with uh, John Donahue on um, Bloomberg. That was really interesting because he, he made a really good point on there about how um, it's not about uh, payments, it's about shopping. Well, I mean, obviously, I don't agree that it's about, you know, frictionless shopping either, but it, it is, his point is the money needs to disappear. And he's clearly, he's clearly seen the curve. And I would love to see PayPal get into this. What I'd really like to see them do, actually, is help get uh, Bitcoin into developing countries. Uh, because they have the reach. They've got the capital. They've got the reserve. Their share price is up 80% in the last two years. Um, OK, that's not as well performing as some other the startup stocks. But they can help themselves to become more relevant. One of the, the, the tough things in Silicon Valley is keeping yourself attractive to new talent that comes out of the of the Stanford's and the you know the other tech based universities so I think one of the ways they can do that is by using taking advantage of their size they're not a bank remember and they they, they were forced to become a depository which is not the same as a bank that just means that they look after the, the funds they're not allowed to do any of the bad stuff like the fractional reserving so they're very very well placed um, 
to get this into to get this into developing countries. Screw this frictionless shopping thing. I, I don't want to hear any more about that. I want to see them have some impact. I agree, and I agree with Christoph's point that this is an evolutionary opportunity for PayPal. They could change and survive, or they could stay the same and die. If they want to be eBay's shopping arm, they could be that. But they also, you know, talking about share price, talking about the monetary value of their corporation, they could make some acquisitions. They could take over something like Cripsy or Coinbase. They could take some of their knowledge and bring it to them. There's opportunities for PayPal in this space, and I think we'll see them expand. They might give it a shot, but Western Union is done. Exit question. Can PayPal act fast enough? We're now at Bitcoin plus five years. How many years past Bitcoin's invention will PayPal last? Christoph Atlas. I think that's a tough question to speculate on. Um, I think there's still time for them to do it, and they have, you know, very they have a lot of resources available to them um, that could help them uh, speed things along. Uh, Overstock, you know, got it done very quickly, and I don't see why PayPal couldn't. The only thing that concerns me about PayPal is that for the last several years now, they've been this kind of like bank-like company, and those companies um, are really good at like following their old business model and just like holding on, you know, until until they die. Um, and so I'm curious if PayPal still has the quickness and the innovation in their in their company to to uh, do something completely new. I don't know, but um, I think I think there's still time for them to jump in at this point. Sure. Absolutely, and I think it's a good point to look at PayPal's history. They have been blocking Bitcoin transactions in the near recent future, as well as they famously blocked WikiLeaks donations. PayPal has not been acting like an impartial bank. They've been making very political decisions in the past, and this might muddy their future. Bitcoiners seem to prefer a more freedom-loving exchange rather than a bank. Megan Lords. Uh, they also block some of free aids funds to the Philippines too. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot is going to have to change. Uh, I think on a um, philosophical level for PayPal to uh, continue to succeed. I can't put a number on how how many years uh, it will take. Uh, but you know, I I do always try to remain optimistic and hope that they will eventually have a change of heart and you know embrace Bitcoin and also the uh, decentralized philosophy of it too. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, PayPal is a bit like a bunch of campers being chased by a bear. It's important to remember that they don't need to outrun the bear. They only need to outrun the other campers so the bear has something to get busy with. Um, and they will outrun the other banks. They will because they've always kept at least the spirit of innovation going. And they're not quite as banky as the other banks. So I would expect PayPal will do pretty well adopting, adapting, and co-opting where it can, and playing with Bitcoin faster at least than the other banks that are going to get eaten by the bear. Chris, Jay. You know how I feel about predictions, man. I don't want to put a date on it, but what I heard from um, John Donahue, uh, by the way, John, if you're watching this, call me about Feathercoin. Obviously, we can help each other out that way. Um, you know, in case Bitcoin doesn't work out for you. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I am optimistic. I like PayPal as a company on the whole, and I, I want to see them adopt this and, and change change before they have to. The correct answer is seven. If they make it past seven, they'll survive. If not, they'll die. Issue four, grab bag. I couldn't decide between three topics, so it's guest choice. Would you like to talk about Super Nintendo Lossky and his Reddit AMA that's convinced the community that he'll adapt? Or the Winklevi and their desire to name everything after themselves with the launching of the Wink Index? Or Wolong the Pumper and the strange and terrible story of PandaCoin? Megan Lords, it's your choice. Okay, so these are all uh, topics that I haven't done a whole lot of research on it, but I'm going to take a crack at the Lasky uh, AMA. Um, so what I read from it, I, I don't know that it was super convincing. I mean, I, I don't, 
I don't know who's saying the Bitcoin community is, you know, convinced that this guy has their best interests in mind. Um, from what I read, it just sounded like the same vague, uh, you know, kind of politician-y answers that you always hear. Um, I don't, uh, I guess I'm somewhere in the middle, though, because... I really do want to hope that as an individual he will be open to uh, these kind of ideas and, uh, you know, be looking at things long term also. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, it, it's important to consider who he's working for and uh, those interests as well. So uh, I, I didn't see a whole lot of, uh, I don't know, of uh, oomph to his answers. Uh, again, like, I, I don't know that the claim that, uh, you know, the Bitcoin community is now convinced that uh, he's on their side is, is an accurate assessment of that. So that's my take on it. I'm somewhere in the middle. I hope that, uh, again, with the PayPal thing, I hope that he, you know, has this kind of change of heart and can come around and see the benefits of Bitcoin as an individual. But uh, I don't know. I'm not convinced. Andreas Antonopoulos. I don't know. I'm I'm bored talking about regulators um, asking their permission in order to create or continue to use a global fluid currency seems kind of pointless to me. I don't know if uh, Superintendent Lossky is the good guy that those uh, Bitcoin community people hope he is, and whether he's going to be nice to Bitcoin. I don't particularly care if he's nice to Bitcoin. I think he should be worried about whether Bitcoin is going to be nice to him and the rest of his profession because uh, at the moment he has an opportunity to make a career out of it by being a pioneer, but this does not uh, bode well for career bankers and regulators um, any more than it bodes well for um, you know ratings agencies of the MPAA or uh, the FCC and various other organizations that were regulating telecoms before the internet. Um, obsolescence is coming your way and it's coming fast and uh, that really doesn't make a difference whether you like us or not uh, because Bitcoin continues and will continue elsewhere if you stop it in New York. I'm actually a bit gratified that uh, he was willing to talk to the community but once again I think that we can see much more interesting solutions than regulation through central authority I think I would like to see, for example, a proposal by Gregory Maxwell that's been circulating, which is a proof for fractional reserve, uh, the, for the fact that exchanges are not doing fractional reserve and, in fact, have full solvency and holdings using a Merkle tree approach of hashes against Bitcoin holdings that are proven to each and every individual account holder every time they log in, uh, thereby, thereby allowing. Uh, those exchanges to prove solvency without showing the total value of their assets. I think very smart ideas like that uh, give us a new path forward for regulation, a path that doesn't require regulators. And I'm much more interested in uh, self-regulation and security mechanisms and trust mechanisms that can be built on top of cryptographic proof uh, rather than trying to replicate the old systems of regulators, hierarchical organizations you know, systems that effectively don't work. They don't work to protect consumers. Chris, Jay. So, I didn't watch it all the way to the end, but I did watch your awesome, awesome video of that Panda Coin thing. And I've got to hand it to you, man. That was great. Post up the link if you've got, like, a chat room or whatever to put this in because everyone needs to watch that. It was very Homeric. Um, it was full of tragedy and drama. You really, really made it. And, and the reason I'm picking on this story... Um, is because I can speak about this firsthand because Feathercoin had this direct experience with uh, Unox back in the summer. You know, we were we were f full of life. We were young people, most of whom had quit their jobs. I'd quit my job already for, for some time, and we just wanted to have some impact. And along came this technology, and you know, communities emerge around need. And what these altcoins represent is divisibility. Um, divisibility by diversification, okay? Um, it's not the same network. This isn't about taking value away from Bitcoin. This is about adding value to the people that are there and getting a flow of value there. It's about drawing trust around uh, borders of trust and culture rather than by fictional national borders. Those national borders aren't there to keep immigrants out. They're there to keep the citizens in. They're there to keep you in order, rank and file. 
And one of the great things uh, that I love in society is heterophilia, love of difference. And one of the things we see in societies is cross-pollination. It's people moving from one community to another. Someone that goes to a chess club might also go to a photography club and they might have something interesting to say. Or expat communities that, like I believe there are more Welsh-speaking people in Argentina. Right, than there are any in any country outside of Wales itself. Um, so you get this kind of cross-pollination. And the reason that's important is because we don't really find our way home until we leave home, right? until we go somewhere else and we find out what's alien about us, until somebody from the outside can tell us who we really are. Because all I get is an inside view looking out. Now, why, how does this have anything to do with the panda coin? So in that chat that you read out so well, Tom, um, was this kind of, this is why you don't want to do, this is why a, a lot of very good people at Feathercoin stepped up when Unox happened. There were a lot of people that were just quiet on the forum who'd been hanging around and, and believed in the project, believed in Bush, um, who wanted to help out. All of a sudden you got this rush of like, we need to save this. We need, I can't walk away from this. You know, Ruth's like, I'm not walking away from it. We can't. Like, we've got to do something. And this is why people don't sign up for these projects in the first place, because they fear that their work will be squandered by another. They fear that they're going to put on all this hard work and then someone else. And this is a problem that everyone needs to be worried about. Fraud isn't something that happens somewhere else. Fraud can happen everywhere. And you need to be vigilant. You need to be asking hard questions of your managers, of the people that you work with, the people that you think you know. Your loyalty needs to lie with truth because the only thing a fraud cares about is about getting their petty little needs met. Right? They are motivated by fear. And you have to stay loyal to what is true, even if it goes against everything that you feel about this this person. And so, yeah, you, you normally there are precursors to fraud. This was a pump and dump by the looks of things. You had a guy that, that had a lot of coins. We saw this with Phoenix Coin, who actually did the dirty on his other developers and ruined their reputational equity in, in, in the process at the same time. And it's duplicity. Um, and it's really sad, and I've seen it far too many times. And again, it distracts us from the story of uh, the heroes in this space. We spend all our time talking about the criminals. There was this wonderful bit that you read out. Um, you did a really good job of reading out this kind of like despairing kind of, oh, I can't, there was like this denial, and they couldn't believe that they put their trust in this person. And, and it quashes hope, and it quashes, you know, a sort of desire to do great things because then then all people want to talk about is how bad the world is you know we'll never get anything done because all these bad people out there and we tell ourselves a story and then we excuse our behavior and we say well it's okay if I don't do anything because you know the world's shit anyway and we're never going to get anything done so let, I'm glad that this all came out in the wash I'm glad that the, that it was all exposed I hope that people are going to take away the right lessons from it what's the update on that just because I didn't get a chance to, to fully get through it all What's the latest? 250 Bitcoin's, Bitcoins? Still at 10, 10 Satoshis, down so you from can, 60. So, and you said something about 250 Bitcoins you can buy what for? What, well, what at the time that he dumped his uh, parent stash of PandaCoin, they're estimated to be worth 250 Bitcoins. So if you had about one-sixth of that value, you could buy yourself PandaCoin. You could just buy the whole thing mm. right now. It's so, definitely available. So that, if someone's going to do it, and it doesn't strike me as obvious as to why they would, but if you did, you were gonna, you'd have to put it in a multi-sig wallet, okay? You'd have to be fully accountable. Um, and I, I think that's a good point, Chris, and something we should talk about, that the issues of PandaCoin can actually be solved by the new technologies of Bitcoin that we've been talking about on this show. It's they talked there. about many times that essentially they were describing multi-sig contracts, but they didn't have them yet. And if they had even a multi-sig that was not... 100% signature, but perhaps a percentage signature, like 80%, 90%, they could continue operating without Wolong, and they could have had their money in bounties for each one of the tasks they wanted done, then their board members could have agreed, well, this bounty has been fulfilled by this address, let's all sign it, and then it goes out, the money goes out. And the same thing for their, their large amount of money that was trapped that the developers weren't supposed to use. You just make six keys. The six developers each get a key. No one can withdraw without the other people's keys. At the same time, you could time lock it. You could just mm. literally do it with math and not be able to so, break the contract. 
and none of these so things this, happen for a pain. This is this is also a good message you need to give the the sort of the maybe the older folk or let's call them the, the luddites, right? The people that are technophobic, is that the, there is there is the, the concern from the sort of agrarian. Uh, section of society is that technology is bad because it makes us lazy and it facilitates you know all these kinds of bad behaviors but actually there are two kinds of technology there's a kind of technology that does that that automates away a lot of very you know important things but also there's a technology that makes us more human and this is the technology that makes us more human because it, it allows us to build bonds of trust that would never have been available to us before. It allows me to make all kinds of what are known as costly signals. Look up um, signaling theory. Okay, just Google that term. That's a whole wealth of information. It spans economics but also biology as well. Um, basically, a good signal in communication, okay, in communication studies, a good signal should be hard to make, impossible to fake hard to make, impossible to fake. It should be very costly for me to generate the signal and then it should in theory be impossible to fake it and that's exactly what this technology enables. It's an enabler that allows you to be able to build bonds of trust at any distance across the world near instantaneously at virtually no cost. You can build trust with someone else on the other side of the planet even if it's just to help them out because of some kind of natural disaster it, 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 or it allows you to raise funding for, for, for whatever and gain trust from a bunch of strangers you've never met. Probably Probably the best person you need to meet right now that can help you get to where you want to go. You probably don't even have time to get to know each other in order to, to produce whatever amazing thing it, that it is. And so, yeah, this is this is wonderful. Um, I mean, oh, sorry, not wonderful that what happened to Panacoin, but it's it's wonderful that this technology is coming out. And I really hope that people take away the right lesson from that and, and don't just despair at it. Christoph, Atlas. Well, I want to build on what Chris said before about uh, trust and signals, but I want to talk about the, the Lossky bit of news. We can't trust individuals. Um, you just can't trust individuals. And what Bitcoin shows us is, is we do have an alternative trust model. We can trust in computers. We can trust in algorithms. We can trust in cryptography. We can trust in numbers but we can't trust individuals. So this is a new paradigm of, of looking at the world and finding new places of reliable trust. And what Belosky represents is the old model in which we attempt to put trust into in individuals, but of course he's at the head of an institution that attracts individuals that are not trustworthy. Um, and it's nothing personal against him. Uh, whoever took his position would act in a very similar manner. In fact, if he became some great defender of Bitcoin, he would simply be fired or assassinated or whatever and replaced by some other some other henchmen. So it's not to do with him uh, personally. But um, yeah, I, th I think we're, we're entering into a, a new model of trust. And people who want to, if people want Bitcoin to be a revolutionary technology, when they look at someone like Lasky and they say, oh, well, he seems like a good guy. Uh, yeah, he's pretty reasonable. Uh, yeah, guidelines and protection for consumers and whatnot. To me, they look like a bunch of people uh, standing at the end of the, the plank saying, well, this, this, this pirate captain that just took over our ship is, uh, I don't know, he seems pretty reasonable. He's not going to do anything bad. Um, and, of course, they're going to be stepping off the, the plank pretty soon. They're going to be very disappointed. And um, the good news is that even though the government is completely incapable of protecting consumers, of protecting depositors, of protecting uh, just about anyone except for the, the small oligarchy, uh, Bitcoin is here to step in and, and take over and to implement this new trust model and to actually lay down some framework for free commerce and dependable trade on a global scale. It's ready to pick up the slack uh, where the government have le has left off and the real problem with the you know the government trying to do this regulation is that they're sending false signals. They're saying, "Hey guys, don't worry about this. We got it. Don't worry about crime. You don't need to prevent crime on your own. The police are there. Don't worry about people trying to enter the the, the country and uh, attack you. We've got a military. Don't worry about about terrorism. We've got this." And they they can't actually protect any of those things. In fact, uh, by and large, they make matters much much worse. And so I think that when people start to see the, the virtue of Bitcoin and this new trust in cryptography and, and numbers, 
they're going to stop paying attention to these false market signals, and we're going to actually start getting some stuff done. We're going to actually start seeing some some solutions to to long-standing problems, and uh, it's going to be a new and beautiful thing. I'm looking forward to it. I agree with Christoph. It's all about trust. And like Andreas said earlier, we have new methods now with Bitcoin where we can actually see inside the bank. We can see the workings of the machinery in the vaults. And they could work out a system where we could confirm that the exchange has the value of money that they have without us being able to see where it actually is or how to steal it, anything like that. We could cryptographically confirm that the money is there. This is a whole new system for banks. This is something they've never had the option for before. They could put on their web page, you can see the graph of where our accounts are and that we have the money. And that's going to be a selling point for new exchanges. And the market will decide. People will use a trusted exchange rather than a brand new exchange. And brand new exchanges will be judged on their ability to prove trust in this trust tree in a technological system, not in an individual like Lossky. But we'll see what happens. Exit question. Which topic is the most important vis-a-vis -vis which topic will be to we talking about again in the future? Megan Lords. I'd like to talk more about the potential for Bitcoin ATMs. Andreas Antonopoulos. Um, I think we're going to be talking about Mt. Gox again because we won't really have a choice but to talk about Mt. Gox again. Chris, and Jay. Again. Um, and again. Yeah it, <laughs> yeah, it is, I'm afraid. It is going to be empty Gox, empty, empty Gox. Um, we need to stop calling them Mt. Gox as well. That's not even a name. Like they, they try to shoehorn that in. It's Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. It's a card sharing website. They probably still got a few of the cards hanging around. They should probably get back into that business. <laughs> um, very valuable those cards. No, well, they you know, scarce. Very scarce. Very scarce. Um, no, very so scarce. I Yeah. Sorry, did you want to say something else, Chris? Um I, w I would like to see a counselor go in. Um, as well to, to meet Mark up in his office. I think he does need someone to go up there and just sort of listen to his problems. Christoph Atlas. Yeah, I guess um, we'll be talking about Mount Gox. I'm, I'm a bit tired of, of the Gox story at this point. Um, ready to see it come to a conclusion. I think in the long term the regulatory stuff will be something that we'll have to talk a lot, a lot more about. Uh, I think there's going to be more and more friction there. Uh, the you know the the gloves are going to come off and it's going to be an all all in out war between uh, decentralized software programmers and um, you know guys in suits. And that's that's what I think is really going to happen is on the third day Gandalf is going to ride in with his white army and some kind of decentralized solution will arise to whatever centralized control system they put upon Bitcoin and this will happen several times over several different, several different layers of the technology. But it'll keep happening because this is a decentralized idea. It's a decentralized consensus system. And that's what we're really talking about is the ability to make decentralized consensus, which we've never been able to do before. And now, moving on to some decentralized questions and answers, if Google will load the interface. Here we go. Let's see, I believe this, this goes to part of our previous question, that we should provide proof to make all exchanges prove that they aren't operating on a fractional reserve and they actually hold the coins they have. Not perhaps an independent auditor, but the math solution should come through. I would agree with that. Let's see, what's going on? Coder Trader here. What will be the news story that makes the public hop back on the Bitcoin bandwagon? The price is scaring everyone out of it. I think this is a good thought exercise. So everyone, if you could just work with me, what would be your story that will bring the public back? Andreas Antonopoulos. You're still muted. I'm still muted. OK, here we go. I, I think we're going to see uh, more and more retailers uh, and large companies gradually adopt Bitcoin. We're still in the phase where every announcement by a large retailer uh, can captures people imagination and you know we could see one of the big ones uh, adopting Bitcoin soon and that would be hugely important um, I'd, I'd like to see 
some of the good news for a change because I'm really tired of talking about Mt. Gox. But um, you know what, what what's interesting on, on the other hand, and I think just in in terms of the perspective, uh, Gox is trading at about a hundred dollars. That's still higher than the entire first half of 2013. So basically, an exchange in potential insolvency with the worst management ever is still trading at uh, a mid-year high from last year because people understand the potential of this technology and they're not willing to give up. There's a reason it hasn't gone to zero. There's a reason it doesn't go to zero, apart from the fact that currencies generally don't. Uh, and, and that's reflected in the other exchanges. So the sooner we solve these problems, the sooner we can get back to what really matters. You know, To me, Bitcoin at 500 is still uh, extremely, extremely low priced and what I'm looking at is the long term potential and I'm willing to hold on uh, for, for, for as long as it takes so good news count the agency of Wilson who is in the ass Chris J so um I think the PayPal story had a potential um, to have taken the attention uh, for us. I think uh, I'm just really this just really annoys me because I I, I hate I hate being right about stuff like this. Um, this empty box thing is just really doing my head in. It, what we need is more courage, and um, I'd like to see some of those speculators on the troll box uh, make themselves useful. They've manage to get some liquidity into that market what they need to start doing is helping other people enter that market that's what good speculators are there for they're supposed to understand their cash flow engage in uh, financing practices like future discounting using ideal um, models for, for for that cash flow right that means that you're able to put some well I wouldn't recommend you do this but you would be able to put some money on Gox okay because you don't need that money right away and so you can leverage your cash flow advantage um, and they can actually make themselves useful and, and and get bitcoins out to to people. I'd like to see, you know, maybe some school projects um, to get kids experimenting with uh, Bitcoin and coming up with ideas. Maybe some hack days. I actually have a hack day coming up in in April uh, with just that's just design focused aimed at Bitcoin. So I'd like to see more more of those things. I don't really like those kind of pump stories that 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 sort of sound too good to be true because then the market overreacts. There's no way of shorting the price at the moment, uh, which means you, the the price just goes up and up and up unfettered. You know, there's nobody kind of uh, holding it down, and those aren't healthy because then you get more volatility. So I'd rather it was a slow, gradual increase from from the ground up, and I'd like to obviously see South America and India come on board pretty soon as well. That would be cool. Christoph Atlas. Well, I think there's there's two um, parallel Bitcoin economies that we're experiencing right now. There's a black market and there's a white market. In the white market side, I've been seeing some new services in the area of um, arbitration and. Uh, escrows and so forth and I think one news that it could be very compelling for people is hey uh, we've been saying for a while that Bitcoin has no chargebacks but guess what there's chargebacks now um, that we can set up trusted third parties that can make chargeback like transactions possible and I think that will be good news that people will pay attention to on the black market side I'm gonna throw out a wild idea here I'd like to see something that's like Silk Road but just for everyday kind of stuff um, and something that people could use in Argentina now or Iran or one of these places that's just kind of blowing up and, and getting screwed over by the, the states there um, that are just, you know, they've gone full retard dictatorship. And uh, I'd like to see a marketplace like that where people have some degree of, they're using some of the protections that the internet affords um, to trade everyday things. I think that would be uh, hugely beneficial to the people in those countries and it would be hugely beneficial news for Bitcoin as well. Megan, Lords. Um, I'd like to see um, maybe gas stations following suit like uh, in Mexico uh, where you have these franchises that are saying we're going to accept Bitcoin. I think it's a very, uh, very easy way 
uh, the, to get people into Bitcoin, I think people would look at that and say, okay, this is very easy. I can buy so many things uh, with it. And so, you know, quick stops, very easy to use that. Or another country, like a major country like India, coming out and saying, we're going to be friendly to Bitcoin. We're going to, uh, you know, be more accepting to it so that uh, in a way we could be like, well, look at what they're doing over here. This is awesome. This is great news. Uh, you know, they're way ahead of the United States. The United States needs to step up its game. Um, in regards to that, so, but I, I, the other answers were excellent too. I, I definitely, I, I would like to see all of those things. I would like to see a large retailer or a new technology, something like Ethereum in a working solution, something people could use. Not to say it's not working, but just something that's finished. But I really think it's going to take the price coming back for the media to get back on Bitcoin side. Even then, they're always going to mention this. They're always going to say the price dropped to $100. They're never going to say that it was on Mt. Gox, that it was because of a certain group of non-technical people running an exchange. They're never going to say that. But we can work through it. Bitcoin prevails and will endure. We've got a few more comments. We've got Bitcoin Builder, which is a place that you can go if you'd like to wager your money on the Mt. Gox coins. You can buy coins there. Will Pangman writes in, did Chris just say, build bombs of trust? Awesome. I'm not sure if he said that, but that's a I great quote. I think I said bombs of trust. Bonds of trust. But bombs of trust would be good, too. You could throw them into an area, create a bunch of trust, <laughs> and then you could move on. The link to the PandaCoin video is at madbitcoins.com. It's towards the end of the most recent episode, and the title mentions PandaCoin. RT News has just announced the price of Bitcoin as the Gox price, which is obviously not the true price. Is this just another example of corporate media, media manipulation of the facts? Not necessarily. It's probably just laziness. And it makes the story sound better and more exciting if you can say it dropped to 100. You can say, oh man, it used to be $1,000 and now it's $100. And it's all these great round numbers and it makes sense for everybody. Like. I mean, you could also say that Twitter used to be at $75, and now it's at, like, $55. I still think Twitter's great. I thought it was great the whole time. So it just happens with prices. Well, there's no an different. extreme laziness with journalism, too. I mean, that's why I don't even... <laughs> I, I write a lot, and I say, but I... I, I just come out and say I'm a propagandist because I don't even try to pretend that I'm unbiased and nothing you read in the media is going to be unbiased. Uh, they're not a lot of times looking for the truth of a story, they're looking to make an eccentric or exaggerated headline. Yeah, Chris Bad News sells uh, newspapers. It's no different from your local news station that's reporting you know, murders every night that are happening one per million capita or whatever it is. Absolutely, and you can, you can always learn more about that story by watching the GNN video countdown. Just search Google for GNN countdown or Nader countdown. It's a great video, a remix, and Ralph Nader basically made a speech that will tell you about all the things that are wrong with the local news. It's a great video. Hmm. Can someone explain how decentralized escrow would work and multi-sig transactions? Sure, okay, absolutely. Right? Yeah, I can I can take that one. So um, I'm not sure about decentralized escrow, but I think the general idea is this. Um, if you are doing a transaction through one of the existing payment networks, you have the ability to reverse or do a chargeback, and that ability depends on you having counterparties involved in the transaction. So there's this misunderstanding that Bitcoin has no counterparty. The truth is Bitcoin has no mandatory counterparty. So if you're trading on uh, PayPal with someone, then PayPal is your counterparty. You have no choice about that. So if you're using Visa, then Visa is your counterparty. On Bitcoin, you can actually inject a counterparty into your transaction at your choice, at the choice of the seller and the recipient. Um, and in fact, actually, the sender of money has the choice of which counterparty they inject. Uh, which gives options to open up a whole marketplace where, uh, for example, for certain types of transactions, you might want to use a counterparty that has arbitration rules that are suitable for your state. Uh, for other transactions that are larger, you might want to have 
a counterparty that's an expert, say, in real estate or in exotic automobiles. You might want to have a counterparty that's an expert in art appraisal and insurance like uh, Sotheby's or Christie's when you're doing an art purchase. And so you may want to go out there and pick a counterparty. Multisig is the technology that allows you to do this. And Multisig at the moment is still in its uh, early stages and experimental stages. But it basically works um, using uh, multiple signatures that can be uh, set to a threshold. So the current example is uh, two out of three. So uh, you would have three signatures in a transaction, and any two of these could execute the transaction. So you could have um, the sender and the escrow service, uh, the escrow and the recipient, or even the sender and the recipient overriding the escrow because the escrow went out of business and finalizing the transaction themselves. So there are a number of different ways you can do it with either one out of two or two out of three signatures um, that enables you to ensure that a transaction will be protected. You can use the same multi-sig technology for other purposes, not just escrow, but also backup. So for example, uh, if you have two out of three signatures and you hold two of them, that means that, um, or rather one out of three and you hold two of them, then that means that if you lose one of your keys for the signature, you can use the other one to unlock the transaction. So it operates as a backup. Um, or for example, you could give someone a paper wallet that has some Bitcoin on it. But what happens if they throw it away, or if they lose it, or if it drops in the gutter? Well, if you have a multi-sig one out of three, you could recover those, those funds. Say, wait six months, and if the person you gave the Bitcoin to didn't want it, you can take it back. So charge reversal is not only possible, but it's possible on a completely programmable, verifiable way where you can introduce third parties into your transaction based on your choice. Here's where it gets even more interesting. These counterparties don't have to be individuals, corporations, or uh, institutions. They could also be algorithmically insured. For example, you could have a, a service that provides uh, what are so-called oracle signatures. These are uh, counterparties that you can inject into your transaction that are guaranteed to sign only if the parameters of the algorithm uh, come to fruition. Uh, for example, you could say, I'm going to add a transaction here and the necessary signature for escrow to release is that the, the current date is past January 1st, 2015. And essentially, that would put uh, an 11-month time lock on your transaction. And if you trust the service to follow the algorithmically generated multisig, then you would be able to ensure that that transaction could not be executed before. So essentially, you've got escrow and arbitrage, uh, sorry, arbitration and um, and capabilities in multisig based on a predictable algorithm. In fact, since you can generate unlimited uh, addresses and keys, uh, you could select the criteria. Go to a website, say, I want it to be based on a date, I want it to be based on uh, some other external event that uh, is under the purview or can be measured accurately by the Oracle. Put all the parameters in and then say, okay, this Oracle key will only sign on February 3rd or later um, if the value of uh, Bitcoin on the average exchange volume weighted is greater than X and create an Oracle address that executes the transaction only under those circumstances. So you can do some really incredibly complex stuff that way and you can even ch chain multiple multi-sig transactions together. The possibilities for, for wills and trusts and estates and uh, value transfer after death and backup and managing your estate, all of those are, are quite uh, amazing. So Bitcoin can do chargebacks, uh, Bitcoin can do escrow, Bitcoin can do arbitration. Uh, Bitcoin can do all of those things, only much, much better. I think we should make a Bo Jackson commercial for that. Bitcoin can do arbitration. Bitcoin can do multi-sig. Because once these technologies come to bear, it's not just about the old institutions. It's about what we can do in new institutions and how we can build communities and how the disaster of PandaCoin wouldn't have to happen again once we totally understand these multi-sig transactions. There could be a board. There could be a community. There could be even a contest to unlock these funds, to make the new logo for PandaCoin, to make the new website, to write up some text. Whatever the job is, we can now have multiple people look in and say, that job is well done, deserves to be paid. And once it's agreed, it's a certain percentage, that person could be paid automatically. The old systems that were required for setting up a firm or a corporation 
are fading away. The new distributed decentralized systems are going to solve those old problems. Yeah, this actually allows and facilitates new forms of government. It allows for, if you, if you think about what a business is, a business is just a sequence of activities, okay? And I would, I would go a little bit further, I'd say it's a sequence of activities brought about by a group of entrepreneurs, that is, people that have the ability to anticipate the demand of others. By my definition, a government is a business. Uh, it's a dying business right now, um, but it's a business nonetheless. And this allows anyone to run their own local government because the the organization itself can outlive its founders. That's what's true about organizations. They outlive their founders. And that that can happen when you know one person doesn't hold the keys to the bank account. In fact, that happens a lot when you do a startup. It's all about maneuvering yourself and making sure that you've got the you know the the password to the Twitter account so you get leverage over the others. You know, I've I've seen all of this politicking before, and it actually it do, does away with the politics. So if you think about what politics is. What do politicians actually do? It, it's it's a totally like barren industry. It doesn't do anything. All they do is point at things that happen and posture. That's it. That anyone can do that. That's not a very interesting uh, profession. You don't add any value. You actually subtract value. What you do as a politician is you find themes and things in, in, in the world and you find commonalities and then you use it against people and you start saying well this group of people have started being nasty to this other group of people and how do we feel about that and then you just want to get elected and so it's all about getting votes but this allows for genuine honest people to be able to set up bombs of trust and be able to say look I'm accountable I've set up this multi-sig wallet it's not just me I've, I've given the other key to my worst enemy that's how committed I am to it that's how committed uh, us two are to getting this working we've given the third key to our worst enemy he's our biggest critic at the, the newspaper or whatever it is um, and that's a great way to, to, to do things and yeah you know I don't believe in governments I believe in people and that's what this technology really represents and I think this technology um, will lead to a lot more cooperation in the future and a mm. lot less exciting scripts like the PandaCoin one for me to read. Mm. What you're describing where they've shared the keys and the responsibility has been shared and Wolong goes to do his pump but he can't do it because he doesn't have enough keys and he doesn't have the support of the community and his whole thing falls apart because of technology that allows people to share, cooperate and build new things together. That's what we're really talking about here. Well, did Andreas want to say something? I, I just wanted to say that there's also some other technologies that play into this. At the moment, multi-sig transactions are limited in a standard transaction to a maximum of three signatures, and you can have one out of three, two out of three. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that one of those signatures can't be based on a key that's more broadly distributed. So you could have essentially a backup key that allows you to override the other two keys in the transaction and then you could take that and using a, an algorithm that's been known since 1979 when it was invented by uh, Adi Shamir which, which is Shamir's um, secret sharing algorithm and what that does is it allows you to take a secret key uh, such as that one that, uh, that un unlocks a particular part of a multi-sig transaction and then break it into multiple parts and set a threshold of how many are necessary. So for example, let's say you have a team with 100 developers. You could have the escrow funds or the corporate funds in an account, but then you could uh, break uh, one of the multi-sig secrets into 100 parts and require more than 90 of them to be reconstructed to override uh, the treasury account. And that would allow, um, through the cooperation, or if you like, collusion of 90 of those developers, the ability to override that single transaction and withdraw the money. Um, essentially what you're doing is, is you're giving voting shares uh, in a distributed system with a threshold for voting. This sounds so much better than what happened in Florida in the year 2000 or what happened in Ohio in the year 2004. It's just a superior technological system that's verifiable and all in the open because it's all checked. You can check it with the math. Sounds yeah, one of the one of the nice things about Shamir's uh, secret sharing system is that it doesn't actually depend on a specific cryptographic algorithm. Uh, it it de it depends on on finding um, uh, finding a, a large polynomial for for a curve, and uh, and essentially that you can show mathematically uh, that that is uh, secure that in fact you have, you can 
construct the key a little bit. If you have one, uh, um, shares, then that isn't uh, how to construct the key. It's stronger than what we use today because it doesn't depend on, on say, a difficult problem or uh, computation that can be brute force. Uh, the mathematics doesn't allow it. Excellent. We have a follow-up question. At this point in time, how do you set up a multi-sig? Does this exist yet in an easy format? I'm not sure it does. This is still pretty uh, technical, theoretical, Andreas. No, it, it does exist. It's existed since November of 2012. That's when the final election was made to create the the necessary uh, Bitcoin fork to enable multi-sig transactions, and then. Um, Simple up to three centuries is being relayed on the network, and you can do multi-sig transactions. Um, you can write your own multi-sig transaction using one of the command line tools. Uh, some of the wallets uh, offer the... We appear the to have lost Andreas, but he was saying that it is possible with the command line to perform... Yeah, you can a... Google it. You can do it in the debug window, and also there's something called uh, bit2 factor as well, which allows you to do... So bit2, the number 2, factor.org, allows you to do two-party escrow. As well. All right, so check that out. It's very high tech, but it is available. The next question, let's see where to go. What um, are the biggest barriers to create? Everyone, so, Barbara, so, we're back here. Did you? Here. Go ahead. Oh, let me see. Okay. So, what are the biggest barriers to creating an exchange in the USA? What do you see as solutions for these barriers that will keep owners and regulators happy? I know some of you guys really dislike regulation. Well, there are a couple of exchanges still lasting in the USA. I know Kraken is based in the USA and Cripsy is based in the USA. So it's not Kraken impossible. Kraken wasn't at all affected by the transaction malleability because planning, <laughs> apparently, according to that. That's what they said. <laughs> That's what they said, isn't it? It's really good. So I think it's possible. I think that... Uh, the issue on regulation is why be the first? Why rush to the party? You're only going to get it wrong. Why let someone? Why not let someone else take the fall first? Why not really understand the thing you're trying to regulate before you regulate it? My main thing is that they should take it slow and try to really understand what they're doing. So, let's see. I, I just wanted to say I don't dislike regulation. I'm morally opposed to regulation. I think they're ineffective and generally evil, but dislike is a uh, unfair characterization. Um, I, I think the also the thing with regula regulations, right, is like uh, you don't want to be the first because there's like this guy, right, and he's like, okay, we're going to play a new game. I'm not going to tell you any of the rules, but if you break any of the rules, I'm going to shoot you in the foot. Okay, who wants to start? And everyone's like, uh, why don't you go first because I don't want to get shot. Um, and then the guy's like, oh, well, you know, as soon as I announce the rules, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable innovation. What's, for, what's up with all these crazy people that don't want to innovate until I not tell them what the rules are? It's so, it's so crazy. They just need me so bad. Um, it's a completely, you know, sick setup that he has and uh, that these people are trying to take, you know, credit for somehow enabling innovation by announcing what their arbitrary rules are. Absolutely. I'd like to see an exchange that um, actually plays with the regulators because one of the interesting that's things that's happening with bit licenses and things like that is that they actually may end up having a lower burden than the traditional legacy banking system has in enabling these things. So you add a lower compliance burden plus the, the fuel of frictionless currency like Bitcoin and the interesting thing is that some of the exchanges that are created out of that, which may be created by people like the Winklevoss twins or others, um, are, some of these exchanges may end up uh, being able to compete against the banks later on on a much, much more advantageous footing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to reveal the fact that uh, the, the one thing that's been protecting the banks from competition and protecting incumbents in general from competition, regulation, something that they're quite happy to spend money on every year because they can spend more money on it than, than potential competitors. Uh, this is going to end up being the anchor around their neck that drags them to the bottom because 
the banks and other financial services institutions that use regulation to protect from competition will will not be able to compete uh, fast enough against these exchanges. They're going to be burdened with more regulation uh, to connect it to their own banking system. So they either have to run these as um, completely external subsidiaries, in which case they get no benefit from scale or... or or they're going to run it in the banking system and they get regular heavily in these new uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, either way, it's going to be uh, hilarious to watch uh, regulated industries fight uh, less regulated industries over which flavor of regulation is better. All right, moving on. Next question. According to an article I read today, there is 40% of the world without access to the Internet. To get crypto truly global, how is this issue to be resolved? Well, first, I'd like to say that that means there's 60% of the world that does have Internet, and I think that's awesome. That's a great yeah, start. It needs to get well into on. rural areas. It needs to get into places like Western China, and I really want to see mesh net technology. Um, it allows for... Uh, distributed uh, internet. It means that anyone on a local intranet, any one person that has the internet, everyone has the internet because you act as a gateway on that server, but it's self stabilizing. It doesn't require an IT manager. Mesh we have to look also at this. Bitcoin over text message might be an op option for some areas. Right. We have to look at this from two different perspectives. One of them is optaking the developing world so that they can reach the level at which this infrastructure can be used relatively down taking Bitcoin and meeting somewhere in the middle. So on the one hand you've got um, SMS capable uh, gateways. Not only is SMS supported functional Bitcoin wallets through Coinbase and blockchain and many others have, but there's also a more kind of uh, distributed guerrilla style of uh, SMS gateway that you can use which is simply an application you put on an Android phone and then that Android phone becomes a wallet holder and gateway for thousands and thousands of feature phones that just have SMS. So on the one hand I think we can reach a lot more people through SMS than we can with full internet connectivity on feature phones and we know that SMS as a financial system works because of M-Pesa so uh, there are a lot more feature cell phones out there and they're much much uh, less expensive to acquire and if you have the ability to store a wallet on them or to store uh, SMS to use SMS to interact with a wallet that makes those phones much more um, useful it makes them much more powerful tools for development and therefore worth investing you know the 10 or 15 euros that it costs to buy one of these phones now beyond on that, um, there is all the possible networks, forms of uh, decentralized networks. And here's the beauty: cryptocurrencies through micropayments can actually fund that infrastructure directly, and so they fuel the development of mesh networks because they can pay spider networks on a on an individual by individual basis. So you can do micropayments peer to peer to the owners of mesh points near you gain and then use the same technology to mesh technology say SMS what you got with to then pay for better uh, forms of connectivity uh, so both are going to happen at the same time excellent and moving on to predictions everyone's favorite part of the show the part where I ask you to predict the future are you ready Andreas Antonopoulos Drop connection to avoid predictions. Sure, Good trick. I think we probably know the other two. Um, I am not ready because I don't prepare for the show. Oh, Chris J. And I'm protected by the fact that my bandwidth is so low today that you can't actually hear that I don't have a prediction. I was going to say the only thing that can make Andreas less convincing is bad bandwidth. Uh, yeah, my pr my prediction obviously is is the Gox thing, but I, I I'm also very fearful. I'm quite bearish at the moment. I think that the price could go down to 
um, lower double digits on Gox, not not on the other exchanges. But and I but I think it will have a very bearish impact. The question will be, do will the speculators just man up for us? There's a just a that's a bit sexist. Will they just grow a pair, any pair of anything, and just just <laughs> provide the support? that this coin needs. I'm fed up with going on that troll bot. I don't go on them much, but when I do, all they want to say, I need the price to go up. No, you don't need the price to go up. What you need to do is show some courage and provide the support. That's what you're there for. That's the function of a speculator in the market. So this is a great opportunity to to buy some, some cheap Bitcoin. I just think everyone's just waiting to see what everyone else does. Christoph, Atlas. I think that mesh, net, uh, mesh nets will be uh, an important technology for getting people like Andreas connected to the internet and uh, get more people into Bitcoin. Megan Lords. So I don't have a prediction, but I do have some news coming from Bitcoin, not bombs. Um, at the Texas Bitcoin conference, we're going to have some of our quick start guides translated into Spanish. Uh, we're working on getting them translated to Arabic and a few other languages and getting those out to people and uh, kind of expanding our efforts on breaking down barriers with Bitcoin, doing demonstrations at borders, getting Bitcoin across the borders. So uh, that watch out for that. I think 2014 is going to be really interesting for Bitcoin, not bombs. Sounds great for international Bitcoin. Andreas, you want to give predictions a try? Yes, uh, I predict that I'm going to need a, a higher capacity bandwidth in order to be able to participate in these shows. And the I met you, suggestion. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, the mesh networks. It's yeah, I see exactly what he's saying. It's it's all about uh, stability of the connection, low parity, long long latency networking. Yeah. And finally, this Mount Gox nonsense ends not with a whimper, but with a bang. Spectacular bankruptcies, horrid tales of woe from inside the belly of the beast, price manipulation, hackers, and more. The Mount Gox movie will make the Silk Road movie look like a black and white film. 8mm, shot on your neighbor's borrowed camera with bad lighting and amateurish production bad. The Mount Gox story will be the story of the year when it goes public. And it's going to go public all over the place very soon. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.